we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, nope. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Most scholars, biblical scholars, agree that chapter 21 of John is a late edition. Something tacked on, likely, by another author sometime after the gospel was completed. While I agree, I also love the imagery that these words offer, that this story gives to us, as well as the connections that this chapter makes for us today. So for today, let's accept this bonus chapter as an Easter gift from our ancient ancestors, and let's revel in the way that it invites us into the resurrection celebration. One of the first things that stands out to me about this story is how Jesus enters into the ordinary, the mundane day-to-day -day stuff of our lives and blesses it, filling it with grace upon grace and making us and our lives holy. As the curtain opens on this story of abundance, the disciples have decided at Peter's invitation to go fishing. Now, it's easy to wonder how these 
followers of Jesus who have had the Holy Spirit breathed on them, who have witnessed his death, his burial, his, his resurrection, and who have been invited to see and to touch the holes in his hand and in his side, could decide that the next logical thing that they absolutely had to do was to go fishing. But it makes a lot of sense to me. They have just experienced the sham of a trial, the public crucifixion and death, the burial and then the resurrection appearances of their only teacher, one who also happens to be their very dear friend. They've endured a lot of trauma. They're ready for a break. So they turn to something familiar while they process everything that has happened and they go fishing. Now when Jesus shows up on the scene, the disciples have been out fishing all night and they have caught a whole bunch of nothing. They're exhausted, sweaty, probably a little cranky, I know I would be, and they're emotionally spent. It's no surprise that they don't recognize Jesus from this distance when he calls to them from the shore. It is surprising to me that they take the fishing advice of a total stranger, though. In my mind, that's one of the miracles in this story. But there's also something about being reminded of the words earlier in John's Gospel when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me. Now when their nets fill up, almost as soon as they cast them out, the abundance strikes the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's Jesus on the shore, he realizes. I can just see him nudging Peter. Hey, hey, Peter, that's Jesus over there. And then we see the impetuous Peter that we all know and love. He puts on one of the layers of clothes that he's sh shed, and he jumps into that water and swims to shore as fast as he can. No one is going to get between him and his Lord this time. Now, when they all make it into shore, they realize that Jesus already has breakfast going. He's got bread and fish cooking away over some hot coals there on the beach. And he invites them to bring some of that monster catch that they've just hauled in to add to that bounty. It's hard not to remember that feeding of the multitude, more than 5,000 people from the five loaves and two fish that one small boy was able to provide. In this case, breakfast for one, maybe a single fish and a single loaf of bread, has exploded into enough for hundreds, way more than they could possibly need. The abundance is astounding. I invite you to imagine with me, if you will, heading in from the lake after hours of fishing at your favorite spots, whether here on Lake Minnetonka or one of the many lakes in Minnesota, coming in with not even one single little crappie to show for your efforts. Now imagine someone you've never seen before, someone you don't recognize, standing on the dock and waving you over this way, away from the dock to this spot offshore and saying, hey, Cast that line one more time. For some reason, you follow that advice. Before you know it, the walleye are practically leaping into your boat. When you do manage to get the boat practically sinking under the weight of all those fish back to the dock, you see this person standing over a fire at the fire pit on shore and the smell hits you. It's the most amazing shore lunch you've ever smelled, and your mouth starts to water, and this person then invites you to bring a couple of those walleye that just jumped into your boat to join into this meal. You'd know something was up, right? I mean, this just doesn't happen. Jesus knows his disciples. He knows exactly what they need in that holy moment. He meets them where they are. He provides the food that they need to nourish their physical bodies, those exhausted bodies. 
He shows them one more sign of unbelievable, abundant life. And what a beautiful image we're all given. A sunrise breakfast on the beach with the risen Christ. Wow. Jesus offers much more for his disciples on this day, though, than physical nourishment and a fantastic catch of fish. Did that charcoal fire spark anything for you? The only other time we hear about a charcoal fire in the Gospel of John is in the courtyard where Peter denies Jesus three times. He denies being a disciple three times. Jesus has some unfinished business with Peter. So he takes him aside And we get this familiar and, at least to me, very uncomfortable exchange. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. Simon, son of John, do you love me? By the third time Jesus asks the question, Peter is broken. Our text says he's hurt, but the Greek is much stronger than that. Grieved is more like it. Peter is cut to his core by Jesus' repeated question. He knows that Jesus is aware of his denial of his discipleship. They both know that he was unfaithful in that dark and difficult moment. Crushed, Peter replies, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. This feels like an odd and and hurtful even exchange to me, but the more time I spend with it, the more I recognize the deep and abundant love that Jesus is showing. Peter needs forgiveness. Peter needs his own resurrection. He needs to know that Jesus believes him when he confesses his love. He needs to hear, I love you, from Jesus. Jesus does love Peter, and of course Jesus forgives him. He loves him so much, in fact, that he invites him into his own work. He invites him, he trusts him to take care of, to feed, to tend, to love those whom Jesus loves. This, at least in my estimation, is Jesus' primary reason for showing up on the shore that day. He's here to tell Peter that he wants him to be a crucial part of his ministry. Not only is their relationship restored, Peter is invited more deeply into the discipleship that he once denied. He is invited to embody the love of his Lord. He's invited into the incarnation. Now Jesus gives Peter a picture of what it will mean to love him and to follow him. Very truly, I tell you, he says, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. The evangelist explains to us, he said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now, Peter can't begin to understand exactly what Jesus means. How could he? He doesn't have the benefit of the evangelist's explanation or the perspective of hindsight, but he does 
get a bit of the picture. He understands that the way ahead won't always be an easy one that's filled with the bounty of this day's catch of fish. Jesus says, follow me, and follow him Peter will, right into a death like his. A death that comes with the promise of a resurrection like his. Along with Peter today, Jesus says to each one of us, to each one of you, follow me. Now the last few verses of John's gospel, which we haven't yet heard, remind us that each of our paths will unfold differently as we follow Jesus. So here are those verses. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If, any, if every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. As I was reflecting on the invitation to follow Jesus and the beloved disciple following Jesus and Peter along the beach, this all got me thinking about dancing. Maybe our psalm had something to do with that too. Now I know it's an odd connection, dancing and this story about fishing, but I invite you to follow with me for just a moment. Regina and I are members of a ballroom dance club, something that we have missed throughout the pandemic. Now when we are able to be together with our club at dancing, it's, it's a beautiful thing. People who have danced together for years, who have loved each other for years, take to the floor. Each couple following their own path. Now, some of our members over the years, I swear, can hardly walk. But when they take to that dance floor, they dance beautifully, following one another. Suddenly, they're years younger, and their movement is incredible. They trust each other. They love each other. They follow each other. Now, while one partner is responsible for leading, the follower leads by giving some signals as well, helping to keep the couple from dancing into others. But as a whole, everyone, all of the couples together are part of the same dance. They're following the same tune. They're following each other. And at the same time, each couple is following their own path. Occasionally, a bad lead is given, or maybe a lead isn't followed, and the dance goes on. Similarly, both the beloved disciple and Peter are following Jesus. Their earthly lives will not end in the same way. Each has their own path to follow, yet they are part of the same dance of following Jesus, part of the same living, breathing, risen body of Christ. That's what it means to experience the abundant life that Christ offers. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Our senses filled with the abundance of life in Christ, our vision set on living into the invitation of fully embodying God's love, we, like Peter, are invited into God's incarnation in this world. As one of our teachers, Dr. Caroline Lewis, puts it so beautifully, 
We are invited to be the I am in this world. She explains that John's understanding of discipleship, and I quote, takes the incarnation seriously so much so that the combination of our humanity and the inbreathing of the Spirit of God means that we do embody the presence of God in the absence of Jesus. Now, of course she's not saying that we are called to be God or that we are called literally to be Jesus. Rather, we are called to share the grace upon grace that has been shared with us, the grace of God's abundant life. We're called to live deeply, so deeply into the following life of discipleship that we embody the love that we know so intimately through Jesus. As we do this dance of discipleship, we each have our own paths to follow. There's no way of knowing how those paths are going to unfold. There's no roadmap, no choreographed dance routine. At times, we'll wonder whether we're even on that path. We may feel overcome by fear, by doubt, by fatigue, or by any number of stumbling blocks. But we can be assured that Jesus will remain faithful, always offering us a steady, trustworthy, and sure lead. And we can be sure that he will supply us abundantly with all that we need to follow that lead. The one who invites us to follow him promises to meet us at every turn, loving us and leading us, forgiving us and feeding us, even as he invites us to be one with him as we love and feed the very flock of which we are each a part. As we live into that incarnational promise, we can proclaim with John that the whole world cannot contain the many things that Jesus did and that Jesus continues to do. To each of us today, Jesus says, Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, follow me, fill the world with my undying love. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.
Having heard the good news, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we make our way to the prayers, I invite you to stand. <coughs> Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, for people in need, and for all of God's creation. Holy One of new beginnings, fill your church with new life. Give us courage and faith like Ananias, to love those who are hard to love. Give us loving, surprising direction and grace when we seek out the wrong way, like Saul. Bind us all together in unity and peace through Christ Jesus, our Lord. God, in your mercy, Amen. receive our prayer. Jesus, Savior of fish and of those who fish, as the waters around us open, and we seek to fill our nets and live wells like the disciples. Open our eyes to see you in creation around us. And give us hearts and hands that work to take better care of your waters and creatures around us. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of abundance, many who work this day feel like they keep coming up empty and don't have what they need. As you filled the nets of the disciples, fill the lives of all in need this day. Fill empty fields with an ample bounty this year. Fill empty stomachs with good, nutritious food. Fill empty wallets and bank accounts with ample work and finances. Fill empty homes and hearts with love and companionship. Fill wounded souls with an ongoing sense of your presence and peace. God, in your mercy, to receive our prayer. Lord of healing, restore all people who cry to you for help in body, mind, or spirit. We lift to you now all those who need your healing touch, either out loud or in the quiet of our hearts. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Ever-present Jesus, be present to faithful ones who are persecuted for following you. Sustain them by your faithfulness and give them strength in your name. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. Holy Spirit, who inspires our song, join our voices with angels creatures, and all the saints in praising Christ, and bestowing upon him all blessing and honor and glory. Reveal Christ's glory to us and through us in our worship. God, in your mercy, receive our prayer. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I invite you to be seated. At this time, we celebrate our generous God, as we heard today in John, right? In abundance in the net, 
And we do so by returning back to God what God has first entrusted to us, ourselves, our time, and our money. And so all are welcome to join in giving as you are able, both here in this place and online. And God bless you in your giving as you help us carry out the ministry of St. John's and the ministry of Jesus Christ. beautiful. Thank you for that offering to God in your voices, in your practice. It's wonderful. Would you join me in this offering prayer? Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, 
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought to us eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. which he was betrayed. Our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. And I invite you to know that the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is given and shed for you. So all who wish to receive this gift are welcome to come forward and commune with us around Jesus' table. As you come forward, you may uh, choose to uh, intinct where you dip the wafer into the wine, which is the darker liquid, or grape juice, which is the lighter liquid, um, or there are little um, packaged cups that you can take off to the side if you so choose. Um, there are also gluten-free wafers, if that is something that people need. Um, and you can also just simply come forward for a blessing, if you'd like, by crossing your arms in front. And so now the table is set, there is a place for you, and I invite you to come and taste and see that the Lord is good.
And now the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, and through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the sending song. the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! Go in peace and tell what God has done. for the bells this morning. They're so good. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for ringing. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Thank we you. Did, I thought we did sound good this day. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. Great, great uh, postman. Oh, we should join.